mentally and emotionally. And so with that mindset, he comes to a place um, the Ford Jabbok, verse 23, 22. And he rose up that night, the night of his distress, took his two wives and his uh, 11 sons and passed over the Ford Jabbok. That's what Jabbok looks like today. It probably looked like that at the time when he had to cross over the ford. And so it was a little bit of um, trying time for him there. But here what the scripture says. He sent them over the brook. He sent over all that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he took advantage of the situation. He touched the hollow of his tie, and the hollow of Jacob's tie was out of joint as he wrestled with him. The man said, let me go, let me go, let me go. The day is coming. And Jacob said, I will not let you go and held on to him I will not let you go and held on to him except you bless me what a spirit of determination to get blessed the angel said what is your name it's Jacob Supplanter, trickster, fraud, cheater, everything is in that name. Okay. Thy name shall no more be called Jacob, supplanter, cheater, fraud. But you shall be called Israel. Prince, you have power with God and with men. Because you have prevailed. Jacob asked his name. He said, no, I'm not giving you my name. And then the end of verse 29. And he blessed him there. There are certain places that you will only get blessing. And you have to find that place called there. And Jacob called the name of the place Paniel. For I have seen God face to face so my subject wrestling with the supernatural is that possible it happened in the scripture but that doesn't mean it's a doctrinal I don't know about you but my life Long years with God has been a life of wrestling. As a matter of fact, when I was 12 years old, from 12 to 16, I loved wrestling. My uncle was training with Ray Apollon and the big guys, and whatever he learned from them, he would come and teach me. In my village, you had to fight to survive. So I began to learn all the skills and the art of wrestling. And by the time I was 16, I was the leader of a group of wrestlers. We had 25 uh, young men in our group, and I was the best fighter. Would you believe that? An innocent-looking guy like me could fight. Yeah, I like to fight. I like to fight so much that we went to three other villages, and I opened up wrestling pits, and I'd fight anybody. You could be as big as, I don't care how big you are, I'll fight you. One time I met this guy, he's, so, he's a mountain, the guy is a bodybuilder, he looks like the Hulk. He came to fight me, I said, you, you want to fight? He said, yeah. Before I know it, he scooped me up like a little baby and he planted me in the ground. I still had the mark on my back. There's a cut that came from the cane stump because we were fighting in the cane field. 
So I had a little idea of wrestling, not knowing that when I get saved, that the Lord would lead me into spiritual wrestling for many, many years. I don't know what you are wrestling with. I'm not talking about struggling. Struggling is different from wrestling. I preached to you a last time on struggling uh, to get to the supernatural, but struggling is, uh, is not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about wrestling. And uh, my theme is after you have wrestled a while, your whole life cannot be wrestling. Jacob wrestled for one night. And after that, this is what I want you to get to the point. To stop wrestling and start resting. Because if your life is just one continuous fight, that's not how God designed it. You should have a time of wrestling, but you should also have a time of resting. There yet remain a rest for the people of God. And child of God, you might become weary, but I have news for you. God has a rest waiting for you. You're in this life. Your tiredness will go away and God will bring you into a new season of rest. Can I hear an amen? So you will have to sometimes stop wrestling and start resting if you haven't gotten there yet. So let me uh, explain to you that wrestling is unlike boxing. You know, you get a punch, you give a punch. Paul had that experience when he said, the messages of Satan came and buffeted me. The word buffet means they're to box. It means to be tied against a post and to be beaten, beaten, beaten with a fist. That's buffeting. We call it buffet here. It's the same thing we do. We eat, we, we strap ourselves around a table with a knife and fork, and we buffet ourselves. It's a close contact sport. But when I check the word rest, it comes from a word rest, W-R-E-S-T. Rest means to snatch something from the opponent's hand. And when you are wrestling, you have to be, have the mindset, the reason and purpose I am wrestling is to snatch something out of the enemy's hand. See, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Why? Why do we wrestle with them? Why did Daniel wrestle for 21 days while the angels were fighting above? There have to be a purpose for your wrestling. The enemy has something and you've got to learn how to wrest it out of his hands. Come on, if you, if you understand what I'm saying, give God the praise. That's why you have to wrestle because you, your intention is to snatch and take back what the enemy is holding from you. So that's why we have to wrestle. But you said, Pastor, your, your subject was wrestling with God. Yeah, let me clarify that. God does not come down anymore physically and wrestle with anybody. God has agents that he employs to wrestle with you. One of them are the forces of darkness. The other is situations. I have had situations with which I am still wrestling with for, for the last 10 years. One particular issue, I'm still fighting, I'm still wrestling, I'm still trying to take that out of the hands of the enemy. I don't know what you're wrestling with. You might be wrestling with health issues. Yes, we all have an idea of how, how that could be painful and how that could be a, a struggle and how we can, and how we've been... So wanting to get out of it, but it's just not happening. 
in the purpose of wrestling? Why God allows it? Why God allowed that problem in your life to stay there so long? Why those issues are not going away? This is one of the problems I had to wrestle with God. And hear it. And don't, don't misunderstand me. I have the answer. I'll just pose the problem. Why is it you have a need? A real need. You caught all the promises of God. And you pray and you pray and you pray. And nothing happens. I have a problem with that. Here it clearly says, ask and you shall receive. Here it clearly says, whatsoever you ask in my name, you will have it. Here he said, ask that your joy might be full. I kept on asking and nothing happened. Why? Because that's the first level of prayer where young Christians come and they get all those answers. But as you climb the levels of prayer, you will find from asking, you will have to move into seeking. That's another level of prayer. And it takes time to seek. And I'll show you something there. And then the next level is knocking. And you have to wait when you go to the door and knock on God's door. And knock and knock and knock and knock and wait. Prayer is not just a simple petition for the young ones, yes. But the level goes up. So, here's a problem I've been wrestling with God. Lord, I know you can, but why you don't? That's the problem. I know, I watched my brother, I went for him almost every day, 16 days in the hospital. And I'm praying every day. And I say, God... I know you can, but why don't you? And I wrestle with that thought. And here he comes and said, what was one of the, the third miracle I did? When the man, the leper came and he said, Jesus, I know you can, but will you? Will you touch me? And Jesus in the original it says, It is my pleasure to touch you and to make you whole. No matter how you feel, no matter what you're wrestling with, no matter what your thoughts are, come to the conclusion. It is God's will to bless you. It is God's will to touch you. It is God's will to deliver you. I want to make you whole. Don't let the enemy argue with you. You don't bring your mind into the word of God. If Jesus did it, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will do it again, my brother, my sister. I am encouraging you to hold on. Hold on, hold on. There are four lessons that we're going to learn from this text. I'll tell you it in a minute. And I'll show you why uh, we have to wrestle sometimes with God. And with the things he sends with us. Verse 24. Jacob was left alone. God's best work is done in us when we stand alone and in the darkness of the night. And we, we, we want company, we want friends, we want believers to surround us. That's wonderful and it have its place, but there is a time. When God must move everybody from around you. And you find it strange. How come my friends don't call me? Why aren't my church uh, 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 surrounding me? No, it's not always that way. God will choose the time when he will cause you to stand alone in the darkness of the night. Because it's in dark darkness you will discover heavenly light. It is in that loneliness you will discover God's presence and God's comfort. Therefore, do not be afraid to walk alone because you're truly not walking alone. God is always with you. Can I hear an amen? Somebody, hallelujah. Jacob was left alone. But he was not alone because there wrestled a man with him. It's funny. When I calculated Jacob's age at this time, he was 90 years old. 
I always used to think that he was about 50, 60, 70, somewhere around there. No, I can do the maths anytime you want. He was about 90 years old, but a strong 90 years. Where, where was Sister Alice? Probably Alice would have given him a fight. This Jacob, 90 year old, held on to this creature whom he couldn't identify, whom he didn't know what source, where he came from, but he had a he had a feeling that there was something wonderful about this because he had engaged himself in prayer. And so there wrestled a man. And the word wrestle, they mean in Hebrew, uh, abak means to grapple or to wrestle or to hold on and to raise up dust in the midst of the activity. And so he was just holding on 90 years old, this man was determined not to let go. No matter how long, how dark, how lonely, he was going to hold on. That's my message to you. Brother, sister, hold on. Hold on. It's a fight, but don't give up. Hold on to what you've been holding on to. The morning is about to dawn. The morning is coming. <laughs> Darkness might endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Can I hear somebody say, joy is coming. Your morning is better than tonight. Your tomorrow is filled with blessings of God. But you've got to hold on. You can't let go because the battle been tough. Because you've been fighting and fighting and wrestling. You hold on. So when... When uh, the angel saw that he was not going to give up and morning is going to break, he doesn't want him to see his face, he took his hand and put it and That's what happened. Medically, that's what happened. He pushed his hip bone out of his socket. And cause the nerve to run down this leg to paralyze it. And when Jacob, the next morning, you see, Jacob was a runner. Jacob ran from his father, his brother. He ran for three days and three nights to Haran. He spent 20 years there and he ran away. From Haran. He kept on running from Esau. He ran from Aaron. Yeah, what I'm telling you. Runner, God's going to do something in your life that's going to stop you from running. And you will have to settle down somewhere, sometime. I could broaden that subject. Some people are running from relationship to relationship, hoping to find something. God will give you the right person if you wait in the presence of God. Amen. Don't run from this to that. Don't run from here to there. Settle down because God is the God who will bless you right there. Right there, God will have to pick a, a mountain top to bless you. He's also God of the valley. He can bless you in the valley. It doesn't have to be a bright day. God can bless you in the darkest of night. God doesn't have to bless you because you have a good job. God can bless you with a better job. No matter where you are or what you're going through, God can bless you. Amen. And the Bible says it's there God blessed him. Now, I showed you that picture because I want to bring four little thoughts here, and I'm almost done. You may not agree with me, but just, just trust me on it. Here are the lessons. God wanted to use Jacob, and from his 12 sons, bring the 12 tribes. 
and form the nation of Israel. So God wanted to do something through him. And the first principle is, before God can do something through you, he must first do something in you. Many of us want God to use us, but we shy away from the process of inner cleansing and the process of inner sanctification. Hear my word today. God cannot work through you unless he begins to work in you. Can I hear? Lord, work in me. Work in me. Bible said the good work that he has begun in you, he will finish it. He has begun a good work in you. Before he can work through you, he has to do something in you. But there's some of us who will not allow him to do that thing in us. And because we are running from God, and because we keep running away from his call, and from our duty as Christian, and not coming to church, which is one of your divine obligations, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. Because you run, he's going to hit you. And stop you from running. And you will go on limping for the rest of your life. He will put his mark upon you. So before he can. Before you allow him to work in you. And you keep running. Before he can do something through you. He has to do something in you. But before he can do something in you. He might have to do something to you. That's Jacob's situation. If you don't willingly submit to God, you say you're a Christian, well then the, the process begins. If you don't willingly commit to God, he is going to hurt you in a loving way. How many of you had Caribbean parents? So you have an idea what I'm talking about, parental love. The kind of mushy mushy loves we have today for children is only spoiling them rotten. In my day, my father didn't talk except he had something in his hand. And usually it was a piece of bamboo or a thick belt. And let me tell you, those were my Ten Commandments right there. And so God is going to get you because he's a disciplinarian. God does not spoil his children. He loves you and he will bless you over and over and, and over. He will bless you and you will say, ah, yes, God is so good. Let me take advantage of his goodness. Let me play the fool. Don't you ever think like that. Because the time of goodness will pass. And the time of cleansing and judgment will come. And strong chastening and disciplining. I am begging you to let God do something in you. Before he has to do something to you. And he will do it. Someone said it this way. Until you have wrestled with God, you will never know the depths of his love. You think God hates you because he hits you? No. It's there you will find out how much he loves you. It's what the shepherd does to the wayward sheep. He breaks the hind leg of the sheep. Because this sheep is always wandering from the fold and always looking for trouble and always getting in a briar patch and is always surrounded by wolves. So what the shepherd in love does, takes his sharp end of a staff, pushes it in the shoulder blade and dislocates it. 
and the sheep can no longer walk then he takes the sheep and puts it over his shoulder and carries him and bandages him and so the sheep discovers the nearness of the shepherd and the love of the shepherd and the sheep bonds with the shepherd and so that sheep will always be walking by the shepherd's side and will never stray again do not wait for the shepherd in his love to strike you walk close to him right now can i hear an amen? amen he may have to do something to some people because they're not allowing him to do what he wants to do willingly you will find the power of his hand or the grace of his heart. And here is the best thing about getting hurt by God. I preached a sermon how God said, I will hurt you, I will damage you, but I could, I could bandage you. I will, I, will, I will affect you, but I can heal you. God can do it both sides. So don't think that God is just pure love. He's great justice too. He's a God of equity, and he balances it out very well. You're good, he blesses you, and he chastens and carries you higher. You're bad, he fix you up good and make you better. Can I hear an amen? amen? The best lesson here is being hurt by God teaches you not to hurt others. We hurt people and don't realize how it happens that's the Jacob story he hurt his brother he thought he was smart tricked him and got the birthright which God was going to bless him anyhow listen you do not have to steal blessings from anybody because what God has for you nobody can take it nobody can touch it your blessing is preserved reserved and is waiting for you to take it can I hear an amen hallelujah so God wants to work with you and he wants to work through you. And unless he gets to do something in you and you don't allow him, he will have to do something to you to make sure that you are where he wants you to be. God didn't want to hurt you to hurt you, make you feel bad. Things don't go wrong and break your heart so you can become bitter and give up. They happen to break you down and build you up so that you can be all that you were intended to be. Therefore view the chastening hand of God as the love of God coming to you. I like to give this little story. It's contradictory, but it's nice. This little eight-year-old boy did something wrong, and his daddy was whipping the behind and whipping the daylight out of him. He must be a, a Trini father. <laughs> whipping him. And the father was crying. And he said, son, I have to do this. You don't know how much I love you. The son looked up and said, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I'm not strong enough to return your love. <laughs> you can't return that love to God when he begins to work his, his whip on the disobedient and the reckless sheep. That will not follow the shepherd. So we're made to wrestle. This is not a PowerPoint presentation. This is a slide point. So I'm sliding to the next last point with power. Wrestling is believing. Because in faith, sometimes you just have to wrestle between doubt and fear and faith. And you have to win. You always have to win. Wrestling is total commitment. You don't wrestle with somebody halfway. 
You stay on that corner and I stay on this corner and we go wrestle. It doesn't happen like that. It's no long distance wrestling. It's commitment. Amen. How many of you watch WWF? World Wrestling. Do you have any fans there before I make the statement? Any WWF fans here that will kill me if I make the statement? WWF World Wrestling Fools? Okay. Got you. But there will be time and blood and sweat. When Jesus was in Gethsemane, what do you think he was doing? Wrestling with the forces of darkness who was trying to put him out before his time had come. Blood, sweat, and tears. Wrestling is whatever it takes. Wrestling has one goal, one aim. To snatch from the hand, the victory from the hand of your enemy. And not until you snatch it, not until God pronounces blessings upon you, will your wrestling be finished. Wrestling is what you give, 101%. You want to win, you can't just stand up and say, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you, you don't take a, a coward attitude you don't you don't wrestle with a passive mindset you size him up you look for him you grab him and you put him down in the ground I don't like that kind of clapping you know you're clapping like you're wrestling Wrestling is a brotherhood on and off the mat. Wrestling is everyone's legacy. Wrestling is a sign from above. It's finding your way to dominate. Wrestling is everything. Sometimes. I'm not going anywhere, said Jacob. I am not leaving. Not until you bless me. That's the attitude I want you to leave this place with today. The determination to hold on to what life has thrown on your table. In your plate. In your lap. You didn't go out asking for it. Jacob was there just trying to pray the night to meet his brother the next day. And he met this divine visitor who grappled with him and who held him and dashed him down several times. But the old 90-year-old young man will not quit. There are times when you have to wrestle. But your wrestling will come to an end when you have snatched from the hands of the enemy that which belongs to you. Then you will come to a period in your life like Jacob did. A time of prosperity, multiplication, blessings, and long life. Jacob would live 59 more years after this experience. Enjoying his sons and his grandchildren. Watching the 12 tribes form. Going down into Egypt. Meeting Pharaoh. And getting Goshen. The best piece of land for, for pasture and for shepherds. His son exalted. That might be you now, fighting for your life, fighting for your children, fighting for your job, fighting for your house, fighting for your health, fighting for to pay bills. You're just fighting, you're just wrestling. It won't leave you! You have to determine, I am not letting go of God in this situation until I get blessed. Until I get blessed. Until I get blessed. 
I'm not talking about little blessing. I am talking about life changing blessing. I am talking about God changing your name, changing your character, changing your circumstances, changing your environment until God changes you completely. Get a hand, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And so, you play stubborn. God who wants to do something through you will first have to do something in you. And if you won't let him do that in you by resisting and having your own carnal mindset and your own plans and your own strategy and you have already planned out your future, watch out. He's coming to get you, to bring you into his will. And the way he will do that, he may have to just do something to you. Permanent damage. Leave his mark of grace and love upon you. Then God can do something with you. What say ye? So this little boy who was wrestling for four years has ended up wrestling for 40 years. And my wrestling is not over. Not until I hear God, see God, face to face. That's the ultimate purpose of wrestling because it's close contact. When you hug God, when you hold on to his promises, when you hold on to the truth, eventually you will see God, you will prevail, and you will see God face to face. Let me just illustrate this quickly. Here's the problem with the church. The problem with the church is that God's face is not seen by the church. What we continuously do is, Lord, do this. Lord, do that. Lord, give me a miracle here. Lord, show me your power there. I want to see your power. I want to see your miracle. I want to see what you can do. Show me. And that's all well and good. But we don't know the person who is doing it. We only know that his name is called God and that he's a miracle worker. And God says, I want you to move out from just what I can do. I want you to see my face. I want you to know who I am. I want you to take a look in my glory. And when the psalmist heard that, he said, Oh Lord, thy face will I see. My heart said, Oh Lord, I will seek your face. If my people which are called by my name, they will pray first. First stage, ask for the showing of his power. Second stage, and seek my face get to know my glory get to know who I am not only what I do because that's all the church been begging for give me this give me that do this do that come here go there ah, God's the caddy boy God's the the doer of all things yes but what about knowing him when Jacob left that night he saw him Face to face. The ultimate of wrestling is to get to know your God better. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. Before our brothers come to help me pray, you have something you feel like singing? He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something, something happened. And now, I know he touched me. And 
I want to pray for you as we keep on singing that and we'll sing it again. I want to pray for you for perseverance. I want to pray for you to hold on. Don't give up where you are struggling and where you are wrestling. If you need that kind of strength, that kind of courage to hold on and not give up and wait for the blessing, the morning is about to dawn upon you. You stand and I will pray with you as we sing this one more time. Touch you. That floods my soul. Yes, something. Something. A half flood. 